So we're up to uh, chapter nine. This is password attack. So we're going to talk about uh, how you steal passwords, how they're stored, and uh, general information about them. So there's password. You have to somehow store password managers on passwords on your computer and on your phone and everything else so it can recognize when you put in the right password. And that's a huge problem. In very early implementations, uh, back in the 90s and 80s, you'd have just a file on there with all the passwords in a, in a list. And then all you have to do is steal that file and you get everybody's password. Um, Firefox still works that way. You store passwords in Firefox, it doesn't by default turn on a master password and anybody that gets to your machine can just click a couple buttons and see a list of all your passwords there. Um, all right, so we'll talk about these. There's online password attacks, which are when you steal it from a running system. And there's offline password attacks, where you steal the data files off the system and crack them offline. And then there's passwords stored in RAM, which Microsoft is very addicted to. They've had this in every version of Windows for a long time. Uh, the, the local security secrets, LSA. Anyway, so a lot of people are trying to get rid of passwords. The US military announced about two years ago they're going to get pass give up on using passwords because they're so tired of everybody stealing and cracking passwords. But they haven't really announced what the alternative is. There are plenty of alternatives out there, though. You can use biometrics. A lot of people want to face that, like the Apple's face recognition or thumbprint recognition. Um, there's digital certificates that have been around forever and private keys and public keys. You can make them for SSH and then you just have this long cryptographic thing going up. Um, but what's always considered most secure is two-factor authentication. Whatever, if you have only one thing to prove who you are, it could get stolen somehow. And if you had two separate things, not two things you know, but one, two different things, the things you know, things you are, and things you have, then it would be difficult for the attacker to steal both of those things and correlate them. So even if they had a dump of a million passwords from a website, they wouldn't be able to go get a million fingerprints and pair up the fingerprints with the password. So the, the difficulty of breaking in would be much more, much more extreme, a real two-factor authentication. Of course, most implementations of it have serious flaws, like the most popular kind sends an SMS to your phone, and then you're logging in on your phone by typing a password in your phone. So both of the two factors meet in one place, your phone. So if I just put malware on your phone, I get them both. And that's, um, and the SMS is sent unencrypted. You know, there's always weaknesses in every system, but it's generally considered that two-factor is a whole big step forward from single-factor authentication, where there is some kind of fact that the bad guy could get. Um, so the common errors, you know, people use short passwords, dictionary words, and the reusing passwords is essentially universal. Uh, Far more than 90% of people just reuse passwords because they can't remember them, so they have some small number of passwords and they use them over and over again. And sooner or later, one of those sites will lose it or you'll lose it, and then people can get in all your accounts. Another huge problem is password reset. Once you have passwords, some large number of users are forgetting their passwords all the time, so you have to have a tech support desk that's getting a ton of requests to reset passwords, which is really expensive, so what everybody does is they make this easier and easier to do. So it can just be some automated process asking you for something simple like the answer to a security question or the uh, last four of your social or something, have it all automatic. So this is the uh, back door and many people have hacked into high value accounts this way. Um, this is why uh, Sarah Palin's Yahoo account got compromised, the CIA director's AOL account, and these guys should not be using these commercial free services for anything important. They should only be using your official company, uh, in this case government account, for serious business because you can't trust these commercial products. The ones that are advertiser funded are of course very low quality and security because that's how they make their money. And their attitude like Google, Google and YouTube are famous for this, like they'll just yank the rug over you at any moment. They might cancel my YouTube channel at any moment, all my hacking videos will be gone. And if they do this all the time to people, and if you complain, they say, tough, it's a free service, get lost. If you actually cared, you should have put it on Vimeo. Maybe I should do that. But anyway, um, free services have no guarantee of service at all. They can just turn it off, cancel your account at any time. And they don't bother to have much security either because all they're trying to do is get more people to see the ads. If one person is annoying anyone, they just pull the plug on them and they don't care. So the simplest online attack is to just try logging in many times and go through a whole dictionary of passwords to get in. That's what they call a brute force attack, although technically it's a dictionary attack, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, so the way to prevent this is to have a lockout policy where people can only make a certain number of guesses before the account locks, or perhaps you don't allow any further guesses from that IP address for a period of time, or some kind of restriction hits in, and uh, that's the game. If you have an online lockout after five guesses, 
then it's very hard for anybody to try any significant number of passwords. Uh, so one issue is to find a word list. You have to guess the username and the password. The username is typically not a secret, not hard to guess. You can just look at valid usernames and try <coughs> to find a pattern. It's usually something simple, like the first letter, the first name, and the whole last name or something like that. Um, you can also get a list of common usernames if you don't even know any usernames to start from. And you can download packet, uh, password lists all over the place. In the old days, people would make these from dictionaries and stuff. These days, they make them from stolen password lists from hacked services. So you get real passwords that people really used, which is probably much better. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. Some of them are free, some cost money. One of the famous ones is RockU. that's included in Kali Linux already. That's one of the first really big breaches. It's got about 100 million passwords. And that's what a lot of people use to start out with. So anyway. Um, you can also take clues like someone's Facebook page to find out what they're interested in and try to mix those words up to make a word list. And there's a tool called Cool that does that. This will scan a website <laughs> and take the words from there. Another trick forensic investigators use uh, is they take every word on a hard drive and they hope the password is one of them and try to break in encrypted <laughs> faults with that. That often works. Somebody did store a word list somewhere in a document on their hard drive. Crunch is another one that will take characters you specify and mix them up. <coughs> I'm not really sure under what circumstances you would know that a password only includes certain characters, but anyway, if you somehow know that, you might want a list like this. Hydra is the most popular tool from this, uh, from Van Hauser, who also wrote a whole suite of IPv6 attacks. He goes to the Chaos Communication Congress in Germany a lot. Um, very powerful stuff. The thing about Hydra is of what it's named after is the multiple headed snake of mythology. And the point is it starts many processes all logging in as fast as they can. So it tries many, many, many guesses per second. This will only work against a service that doesn't have any lockout. If it will really let you try with say 100 logins per second for all day, then this tool is the thing. It will really try all those with logins and get in. Um, and you can adjust it to various levels of speed like Nmap or any other scanner. So that's, that's probably the king of the online attacks. But online attacks only work against very stupid defenders who haven't even got any kind of intrusion monitoring or lockout threshold. Letting someone just try a million logins in a day just shows that you aren't even trying. You don't know what you're doing at all. So the other thing is the offline attacks. You store the files off the server that store the password and then you crack them. Now modern devices all hash passwords, which destroys information and cannot in principle be reversed, and that's okay for a password. You run it through a hash function and store the hash, then when the user sends in a password, you run it through the hash function and compare the hashes. If the hash matches, you let them in. You do not need to reverse the hash, you only go forward. And there is, for all modern hash functions, there is no known way to run them backwards. But what you can do is just feed in a big dictionary and hash every word in the dictionary and then look for a match. And if the user really had like a 20 character random password is not going to be in the dictionary and you're not going to be able to crack it but almost nobody has passwords like that they usually have passwords that they've used before they're on one of these stolen password lists microsoft for some unknown reason decided to encrypt the sam file the security accounts manager that contains the password but they encrypted it with reversible encryption and they put the key in the system file these are just two registry hives so it didn't take long before people figured that out so i don't know why they bothered at all it does mean if you want to get a Microsoft Windows password, you have to steal both of those files, system and SAM, and then run them through utility that will steal the key from the system file and decrypt the SAM file, and then you have a password hash, which you can crack. Now, password if you run hash passwords through a normal hashing function like MD5 or SHA-1, that doesn't protect them at all. It doesn't protect them very much because those password those hashing functions were not designed for passwords. They were designed for integrity checking of downloaded files. <coughs> the idea is you'll download something like a movie that might be 10 gigabytes, and then you want to um, see if it's right. You want something like an MD5 hash, so the hash function has to be very, very fast to calculate, so you don't have to wait for hours to do the hash of a big file. So it's primarily, primarily designed to be fast, and that's just what you don't want for passwords. That means you can run a huge dictionary and hash all, all the words in a dictionary very fast. So to make it slower, you do stretching, where you don't just do one round of MD5, you do something like 5,000 rounds of MD5. That means the attacker has to do 5,000 times as many computations to get through the same word list, and that slows them down. 
<laughs> now, even if you stretch them, there's a possibility that people will uh, take a long time and just accumulate a giant dictionary of all the password hashes, and then they can just look on that to look things up. So to avoid that, you do salting. Salting is where you add random characters to the password before hashing it. So if two people have the same password, they'll have a different salt, so they'll have a different hash. So you cannot make a master dictionary to look if the password hash is up in. Here's the SAM and the system files in the Windows machine. Uh, there's SAM, security, software, and system. SAM and system are the only ones you need um, to get off the machine if you want to crack passwords. A lot of forensic tools like NCASE and so on will do this all automatically for you. If Windows is running, you cannot copy SAM or system files. They're both in use. The way to get them is to, one simple way, is turn off the machine and boot from a Linux boot disk. Then the system is not running and you can get it. However, if they've used BitLocker drive encryption, you can't read any files while the Windows operating system is not running. So that is there to prevent that. Now, in Windows XP, there was a C Windows repair folder that had a backup of these hives, and it wasn't protected, so you could just steal them from there, but Microsoft took that away. Now the backups is put in this thing called Regback instead, and you can't get it either while the system is running. It's similarly locked. So to get it, you have to do it some other way. Now, if you have administrator rights, you can run Reg, and Reg will dump out registry keys, and you can dump it from the registry. Those are the registry hives, and you can dump them here and get copies of them. So that's one option. Uh, if you do get the SAM file, you can open it in Notepad. It's just encrypted junk. There's a few parts of it that are readable, but the passwords are scrambled. It's actually using 128-bit RC4. RC4 has its own cryptographic weaknesses, but they're not relevant here. The only thing wrong with RC4 is that if you can actually run hundreds of millions of encryptions, the results are not quite random, and that can be used to pump out keys off something like an HTTPS server. But the SAM file is small, and you don't get an opportunity to, to get that many samples from it. So you can use BKHive to steal the key from the system and then uh, decrypt it and you can get your keys out of here. This is called the boot key. That's the uh, RC4 key that you use to decrypt the system file. Anyway, then you can use SAM dump to dump the file and you will now get the password hashes. So uh, the user has a username, they then have a user ID number. This is the same for Linux and Windows. Uh, the built-in administrator account is 1,000, and then you have 501 here in Linux. I think it might be zero for the, the root. But anyway, you got a number here. Then you got two hashes. This one called AAD. This is the old LM hash routine, which is so terrible even Microsoft quit using it. And it's just an empty placeholder now. The second one is the NTLM hash. And that's the new enhanced security system from the early 90s that Microsoft has never updated. So like I say, if you can boot from any kind of other device, like a live CD, and have Windows not running but gain access to the hard drive, you can copy these files off easily if the hard drive is not encrypted. <coughs> so, I've got a few cahoots about that stuff. Six questions. All right, what's the strongest method for authentication? Right, two factors strongest, called strong authentication. All right, how do you block an online brute force attack? All right, that's help block out. Good. All right, how do you prevent attackers from making a dictionary of hashes? All right, that's what salting does. They would have to make a separate dictionary for each salt value, so it makes it much more difficult. How do you slow down an offline brute force attack? All right, 
that stretching. It's doing many repetitions of the uh, password. I'll smooth these because they're just sorting out the beautiful Kahoot music. So, all right. So where do I find SHA-512 hashes? They are in shadow file. Only Linux uses those. And by the way, it is not as simple as just one round of SHA-512 or even 5,000 rounds of SHA-512. It's actually kind of complicated with 23 steps where you have two different hashes being calculated at once and you're sort of mixing the bits between them. But the strength of it is primarily determined by 5,000 rounds of SHA-512. And it goes in the shadow file in the ETC directory on Linux. Microsoft does not use SHA-512 at all, unfortunately. It would be a lot better if they did. All right, so what hash function does Windows use? If you remember this, I don't think I saw it yet, but certainly in the last class. <coughs> All right, that's it, MD4. It is, came out in 1991, MD5 did not yet exist. So Microsoft uses one round of MD4. All right, so if you want to crack your Windows passwords, you can use Hashcat. It's the most modern tool, a lot of people like it. Uh, it can track passwords in almost any format. And you'll find out that you can crack a million pass, you can try a million guesses in just a few seconds for a Windows password because the algorithm is so simple, one round of MD4. Uh, so now Kali, uses 5,000 rounds of SHA-512 with assault, and that's what Mac OS X uses, and you can see it in your ETS login.defs file. You can see what your Linux is using for a password system, and the default is 5,000 rounds here and SHA-512, uh, which is the longest form of SHA-2, and that is much slower to calculate. So if you try to crack Holly hashes, you can only try 500 words in a time as you can take try 500,000 Windows password hashes. So it's... Um, if you have a Windows password, it has to be much longer and more complex. A Kali password that just isn't, you know, the name of your dog plus your birthday is probably good enough if it's a Kali password hash you're trying to crack. Or for that matter, Mac OS X password hash, which is done the same way. Uh, because they're just, they don't have a legacy to stay true to like Microsoft. Microsoft has just neglected their local storage of passwords for 25 or 30 years now, uh, just like they've neglected their DNS software. One of the amazing things my DNS students find out is when you make a Windows DNS server and it's doing absolutely nothing and you query your own server on 127.0.0.1, it is so slow that it times out, which is amazing. But the DNS software is a legacy from the old bad Microsoft back when they just didn't seem to care much. Anyway, so John the Ripper is a lot more fun to use. John is smarter. John will figure out what kind of hash you have and crack it. It'll even automatically choose an appropriate word list and try to crack it. So most of the time, all you have to do is store the password hashes in a file without, and then just have John the file name, and it will figure out what to do and do it. So it's fun. Um, Hashcat claims to be faster, and it's much faster if you actually get OCL Hashcat, and then you get some hardware, like hardware with graphics processors in it, and maybe even a cluster of machines with many graphics cards of the right kind, then you can really go fast. The graphics processors are something like 100 times faster than your CPU at this kind of work, and you can cluster them together, so that's how you really crack them if you're serious. Uh, get a whole, like take all the rooms in the hacking, all the computers in the hacking lab and put them together, and you can be much faster. Uh, you can also use a cloud cracker service. Moxie Marlin Spike put this up a few years ago as a sort of a demonstration of the insecurity of protocols like WPA, WPA2, and other ones using MS CHAP version 2. And he uses a cluster of Amazon virtual machines and charges some money, and you can crack anything in a brief period of time there because it just has a large cluster of machines to use. And uh, maybe that's it. You have 300 million words in 20 minutes for $17. I think he said uh, in a talk a few years back that he could crack any WPA2 password in like for like $100 at computer time or something. Anyway, um, Mimi Cats is the other way. Microsoft has made extra copies of your password. They're not all in the SAM in the system. There's another thing called the Local Security Authority, and it has something called LSA Secrets. 
and in um, earlier versions of Windows it had a lot of things in the LSA secrets. In later versions it has less, but it still has the plain text password of the currently logged on user. Apparently Microsoft has some reason to think they're going to need that again. So it's in there and it's stored with reversible encryption and um, Dan Ochoa, yeah, I think in America, wrote a tool called Windows Credential Editor that finds the password and decrypts it. And this guy in New Zealand uh, wrote the Mimi Cats tool that also does this. He also is a real expert at Kerberos and he can really mess around with Microsoft Windows Kerberos authentication on domains. But anyway, you can recover the currently logged in user's password without having to crack a hash. So it doesn't matter how long or complicated it is, it's stored with versatile encryption in RAM. When they log out, though, it's gone. And then the only thing you can do is crack the password hash. Although, of course, you can also just pass the password hash and use it on a Windows network. You do not need to crack it. You can just pass the hash and use it, which is kind of nuts, too, but that's the way Windows domains work. All right, and like I say, there are many uh, password lists available, so you do not have to generate them yourself. You just take a dictionary of all the stolen passwords. There are many of these. Um, Troy Hunt, a very famous Australian security researcher, has made an online service called Have I Been Pwned that has a list of all the publicly available dumps on his server. And he won't give you the list. Maybe he will if you convince him you're a legitimate researcher. But he will let you query against the list to see if your password's on it, or email address is on it, so you know if you've been uh, had your password dumped. Anyway, uh, past phrases are vulnerable too. This is one of the typical advices, is to use a whole sentence. But it turns out that if you're going to use a whole sentence, most people choose sentences they can remember because they are famous sentences. Something from the Bible, something from a song. And so these guys went and scraped all of Wikipedia and all the Bible and the, all the Shakespeare and all the books they could think of. I think it went through the, uh, the Gutenberg Library of all the books that are out of copyright and accumulated all the phrases and found that it wasn't a really big list, a few billion phrases, and they could then crack them. So they cracked things up to like 42 characters. Um, so even phrases are not necessarily safe from cracking. Now, if you really had 42 random characters, none of this would work, but then you couldn't remember it. So it's a problem. So here's what he did, 16 character strong passwords in less than an hour because they were hashed with MD5. They were able to try them all, but notice these aren't completely random. How do you think Christy, Jiminy, Master, you know, these are, uh, I don't think anybody could crack a 16 character random character password if you could remember one. Um, I don't think anybody could do it in any reasonable amount of time. And here's more of this stuff about using the Bible and YouTube and online sources to just get all the possible phrases anybody might be able to remember. And here, this is all essentially social engineering. You are not attacking the mathematics of passwords, you are attacking the psychology of humans. What could humans remember? And uh, it's not that many. So to dump the passwords from RAM, it's stored in RAM with digital reversible encryption. You can get it with Windows Credential Editor or Mimi Catch, and maybe other tools, but those are the two I've used. Um, all right, and I just thought it was fun to see how passwords are, are used in real life. In 2012, one of the hacker gangs called Team Ghost Shell dumped out about 40 companies' passwords, entire lists, and I went through it to see what kind of people passwords people are actually using in web services. Now, the operating systems we've already talked about, there's really only two. There's <coughs> Linux and Windows, and we understand how they work. Windows is one round of unsalted MD4. Linux is 5,000 rounds of salted five, SHA-512. These guys had some political statement about why they're doing this, which is always just random nonsense. And um, then they dumped out stuff. They've dumped it off to CIA services and so on. This is not the CIA you're thinking of. This is like a housing project in Florida. that happens to have that name. And so here's passwords. This is a company called uh, Sparkland, I think, right? Let's see. Uh, no, Buchanan Bond, a bond investment service. And the passwords are Buchanan Bond 1, Buchanan Bond 1, Bond 1. Um, so they're stored in plain text, stolen by SQL injection, and they're all the same. It's just the name of the company plus one. So that's good, clean fun. Here's the, uh, here's the passwords for Reeves and Associates, a professional law corporation, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Most of them are JJ Law 321. If they're not that, they're OS Law 321, and on you go. So those are the passwords uh, protecting the legal documents at that company. Sparkland is an auto parts store in Japan. And all the passwords are just <coughs> sparkling. So that isn't going to stop people too long. Uh, all right, B Forward is another company. And this one is a PII dump, which caught my attention because there was a big scandal at the college about a supposed PII breach. 
that was fake at this time. But see, if you just lose someone's name and password, at least until very recently, that was not considered a PII breach because that's not personally identifiable information. Because the point of the law is you have privacy about what you're doing. But if they dump something like just your name, that doesn't really identify you. There could be other people with the same name. But if it's your name plus your birthday, or your name plus your driver's license number or something, then it uniquely identifies you. And now companies are liable for legal punishment for leaking that kind of information. But your password is not publicly known. So your name plus your password alone is not a PII breach. Now, I, of course, rebelled against this, say, you're out of your mind. They can log in your account, learn everything about you. But that's not how the law is written you would have to argue in court that that would happen. But the actual password itself is not PII. Although I think that's been changed recently, at least in California. But this is really PII. They got people's names, addresses, the amount of money they owe. Looks like telephone numbers and dates. That's a real PII breach. So if these guys are doing business in America, they're gonna have some uh, breach notifications to do. And the same people had more plain text passwords. At least they're different. Views 82, Mode, Ramarari, AA, Yusuf. Looks like they're uh, names from a foreign language, but at least these people did change their passwords. And this is why I ultimately got a password manager, because you begin to realize what's happening at the other end. You have your password, you put it on 10 sites. At the other end, they're just putting it in plain text in a database, right on the web, open to SQL ejection. So, and for every breach you hear about, there's got to be at least 10 you didn't hear about. So, uh, you, even if you're protecting your password, very few of the people you're handing it to are protecting it at the other end in any sensible way. So here's, I, so that's plain text. And here's eForward.jp. Here's your password, MD uh, base64 with an equal sign at the end. Uh, that's just bytes. Now they say in their privacy policy, we employ commercially reasonable security measures to protect your privacy. And their commercially reasonable security measure consists of nothing more than base64 encoding. There's the plain text password. So that's, uh, that's what commercially reasonable appears to me. So then you've got something that gets down to sort of up to the level of Microsoft password hashes, where you have MD5 or SHA-1, one round of that. So here's a company, here's the passwords, and the guy that stole them with SQL injection wasn't a very good cracker, but he was able to crack this one, Hiawatha. Uh, this is how we found out about the LinkedIn breach. This person that stole the LinkedIn database was not very good at password cracking and couldn't crack a bunch of them and posted them on a Russian forum, a small set of like 60,000 hashes that were harder to crack to get help cracking them. And that's how people became aware that LinkedIn had been breached. So this guy did the same thing. These are MIT's passwords, by the way, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They were breached. Some of one of their systems was, and out come these uh, MD5 based job or password hashes. And even though the person that dumped them couldn't crack them, I just went to an online MD5 cracker and this got Vorg 7R5A, which is a pretty unusual combination of letters. So that online database there has got a pretty good dictionary of MD5 hashes. And since it's not salted, you can easily have a dictionary of a hundred million or billions of passwords and their hashes available for querying online. So MIT does have a form where you can report the incident, and I did. I don't know if they did anything. Of course, to be fair, I went to college security a few years ago, and almost all colleges have problems like this. They have many databases. Probably their main database, where all the students are, is protected, but somebody somewhere in some peripheral department put up a server and had some people logging in and just put up something unsafe. That I don't think that anybody is claiming they dumped the main database at MIT, just some database of some users of some system at MIT. MySQL has its own password hashing system. You can see them here. This is dumped by somebody. These are MySQL password hashes. They look pretty short, like CRC32s. There are different versions of it. Uh, you can crack those with Kane, a tool we used in the last class, a nice Italian hacking tool. It has the ability to crack these things. Um, and here it is cracking that one, MZ6AI. Uh, if they're reasonably short, you can crack them with Kane. Here's a SHA-1 hash dumped off. That's just a raw SHA-1. It's 160 bits long. And you can just crack those at online crackers too. So that is Ben followed by 246-90740. And that's a pretty good password, you know? Three letters and what, about eight numbers, 11 characters, and yet still one round of SHA-1 is not enough to protect. <coughs> 
characters, the next version of MySQL, MySQL 5, now goes up to this kind of password hashes with a star in the front, a much longer series of hexadecimal numbers, and uh, those are stronger, harder to crack. I was not able to recover anything from these. Here's WordPress passwords. Now, WordPress has this system with $P, and I think it might be the one where that's actually uh, stretched, and the letter tells you how many times it's been stretched. Um, here's uh, relative space. These look like uh, SHA-1s, and you see out of the four, three of them are already cracked. Notice that these two are both chicken two, and the password is exactly the same, bfoo, bfoo, so there's no salt in use. That's what happens when you have no salt. And I think I was able to crack the missing one. The missing one was D46. Yeah, and I went to D46, and it reversed to E-V-A-N-A-T, a six-letter password. So it is, uh, I think, SHA-1. All right, so here's the CIA services with several dumps, and here they go. There's a database with names, another, and here we got addresses, and here we got phone numbers. So this is definitely a PII breach for the company. And um, all right, so here's the point of algorithms. You have these one-way hash functions, then you ought to add a salt, and you ought to stretch it to make it more secure, of course. And if you do that, there's a nice article here going through all the types of hashes and salts. And his bottom answer is to use bcrypt. There's bcrypt, scrypt, and p password derivation pdkf2, all of which serve um, similar per pbkdf2 is the other one. All three of them do essentially the same thing. Add a salt and a few thousand rounds of a normal hash function. Um, there is a, uh, but this is a good explanation. All these are useless. All these normal hash functions are too fast. So they make it easy for the attacker. You just have to have thousands of rounds of these, and then you have bcrypt, scrypt, and pbkdf2, all of which are just algorithms that employ that strategy. There was a password hashing contest for the last several years at PasswordsCon that used to be part of B-Sides Las Vegas, and a bunch of European mathematicians proposed ones, and they had some exotic new algorithms that are supposedly better. <coughs> they have more better properties, but these are the ones currently in use, and in fact, most of the time, they don't even use these correctly. So, uh, you know, there's those are people at the top of the pyramid really trying to invent the best hash algorithm. I'd be happy if people would just do the normal stuff correctly. All right, I went through a lot of the systems. I took a class in um, online content management systems, and while the other people were learning how to make their web pages pretty, I was attacking the encryption and all of them. And I'll try to, so Joomla is appalling. It's the only product I've ever found that's actually worse than Windows. Um, they use one round of MD5 with a 16-character salt, but the end result is it's plenty fast. Here's that Microsoft MD4. Here's WordPress's MD5 with an eight-character salt. And here's Linux. And here's Drupal. Drupal is even stronger than Windows as far as the intrinsic mathematical strength of the hash is concerned. They just had a bunch of other problems with the software, many versions, like software SQL injections and stuff, but their, um, their hashing is actually pretty good. Anyway, I got a few more cahoots about that. Okay, six questions. All right, what directory had password hashes in XP? All right, and that's the repair directory. Let me just to mute these participants. All right, and uh, they took it away finally, but the repair directory had them, and they were accessible even while the system was running. Oh, what system is so weak even Microsoft won't use it? Uh, that's LM. That was Microsoft's original system, which used actually DES because it's so old, it predated the proof that DES wasn't safe. And uh, that's the one they upgraded to NTLM in 91 to go up to the glory of MD4, which was better than the previous one, but still millions of times worse than the current ones. All right, how do you get plain text passwords from RAM? Alright, 
That's Mimi Katz. Good. Where's the large list of stolen passwords? That's Rock U. It was a very popular website, and one of the really gigantic breaches. All right. What's the weakest password hashes? Windows is the weakest. WordPress is not bad. Windows is the weakest on that list. Right. And which one can run on a cluster of graphic cards? What you do if you're really serious about it. That's OCL hashpad. All right. So cam is two, and then I've got Kaji and pop pop rat. Well, then I'll I'll just clean up here and go to the lab and help anybody that wants to work on campus.